You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Jinta. And as like an older dad, you're just kind of like, shit happens, because that's just part of being a dad. And you're just like, hmm, hmm, I'll, I'll figure this shit out later. I'm not going <laughs> to worry about it right now. I'm not going to let it freak me out. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to react to it. Like, I'll deal with this shit later. You're just, you're, you're way more patient with all the things that are just bound to happen. And I think that's so important with raising a kid, because their brains are so malleable when they're that little. That's the other thing too. I think a lot of young dumb parents think that just because they're two and three years old, they're not fucking downloading all that information. And that's not like totally changing who they're going to be as adults. I don't think they think that far because they're like, oh, they're not communicating with me. And they don't know that I'm screaming at their mother. They don't know that I'm watching this bullshit. They don't know that I'm, you know, but they are, dude. They're, they're, mm-hmm. they're all that's all those brainwaves, those pathways are being being formed at the, even at that age. I've been in rooms where people have been doing lines of cocaine and there've been infants on the floor. And like yeah, that, that was literally like, before I left, I kind of, I mean, I was the youngest in the room and I'm like, I feel obligated to verbal, like vocalize just for myself. Yeah. Just so I feel better. Like, hey, oh, this ain't right. And then I left and like, yeah, yeah, they're two o'clock. They're, they're two years old. I'm like, how many years of med school do you have? Okay, I'm yeah. gonna go. You know, my, and my, my, my family is a, is a perfect kind of an example. And now obviously there's always exceptions to the rule. It doesn't always play out this way. But so there's the two oldest. I'm the oldest of, of four of us. And, I, and then my sister, who's one year old, younger than me, um, we have a different father. So my father committed suicide when I, was, when I was seven years old. My mom then marries into an abusive relationship and then has two more kids. Now... For the next 13 years, they have this crazy, and I mean like crazy abusive, like throwing frying pans at each other, cops in and out of the house and stuff like that. And being the oldest, I was always bringing it up. Now, I'm already eight, nine, 10 years old. So I'm already at an age where I know this is bad behavior, mm. right? So I'm like, I, I, I don't like it. I want them to, to leave each other and divorce each other. The two little ones who are one, two, three, four, five years old, they have no memory of mom and dad fighting. In fact, once they, they come to age, they finally divorce. And but here's what happens. Now, my sister and I, who are the year apart, we get older and are we good, Doug? No, we're good. Am I recording sound too or no? Yeah, we got okay, so I'm on on everything just so you know. Great, so yeah, yeah. my sister my sister and I, we end up in these amazing relationships, but we wait. We wait way later in life. We don't have kids early. We're very skeptical of who we're gonna settle down with, like probably to a fault almost, right? Because a lot of people thought I had commitment issues. But then you look at our, our partnerships, like my sister's husband is fucking amazing and perfect for her and they have an amazing relationship and great communication. The same thing with Katrina and I. And then you see the two youngest who didn't rem- don't remember any of the fucking craziness in our house, but they are in these crazy relationships where they're screaming and yelling and drugs ab- drug abuse and just dysfunction like crazy. But that's just it is, and they and the, it's even more dangerous because they didn't they don't think they picked that up from mom and dad. They think mom and dad just oh they didn't love each other and then they eventually divorce, because when they were really young, all that crazy shit was happening. And what it is is I believe that 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 gets hardwired as normalcy. So when you're two, three, four, five years old and frying pans are flying, screaming, yelling, cussing, all this madness in the house, too young to rem- recall like that age but enough for the brain to go like, oh, this is normal. Mm-hmm. So then you fall into these relationships that you're attracted to that and you and you don't think it's weird and dysfunctional. Where my sister and I, we were already old enough to be like, this is fucking bad behavior. I don't want anything to do with this. And so we went the opposite direction. So that's my theory. Well, do you ever have any like apprehension around confrontation? Like I have friends who grew up in similar things where it's like, the second it's like a fragile Frankie Merman in the Seinfeld episode where anything where anything went bad, the guy went into the woods in his van. Like anyone some raised their voice like, yo, I know this scene. I know how this plays out. I don't want frying pans flying. I'm out. Like, is it difficult then? Well, like where you've seen it and you knew it was bad. Then when you see the warning signs of it now, are you like, not now, but at a certain point, we're like, yo, what the hell about this shit? Again? In my, 
in my 20s, that's what I meant by to a fault even, right? I probably even didn't give some decent girls a chance because I was so adverse to it, right? So I had I had girls I dated for like a year and a half. So I remember one girl, it was two years I was with her. She was living with me, and we had a pretty damn good relationship. And she, there was we were playing video games, my buddies and I. We're like 25, I'm like 25 years old or something, right? And she, she screamed at me like one time, bro. And I pack your fucking shit and go. Like after a two-year relationship, one time of raising her voice to me and yelling at me in front of people and stuff, that wasn't like, I would have brought, maybe I might have put up with it if she did it one time behind closed doors and like I could control it. But the fact that she had the audacity to to go to that level in front of other people, there there's that like that freaked me out enough. I was like, uh-uh, out. Like pack your shit up, get it out by the end of today. And like I ended it like that. And there was other relationships similar to that where if I had a girl, I did this other girl that was, bipolar I didn't know she was bipolar until we were dating and the way I found out we were in Reno and we we're there for uh, a holiday and uh, the way I found it she was so she used to use marijuana to medicate to keep her like kind of fucking normal so if she was high she was cool mm -hmm. but if the, the high wore off she was fucking switched I didn't know this until we do our first trip out to Reno and we're uh, we're at the circus circus I'm in my mid mid 20s or late 20s somewhere around there and uh she just she I can tell she's on edge because we get there and she calls room service and uh, like five minutes goes by and our food wasn't there and she calls down again. She fucking like rips this lady like a new asshole like our for our food. And I'm like, what? The, where is this coming from? And it was just like one thing after another of the weekend. And I remember thinking to myself like I'm done. Like I'm going to tell her. But as soon as we get back, like she's I'm, I'm walking away from this relationship. We're in the elevator. It's the, like Fourth of July weekend or something, so it's packed, right? And we're on like on the I think the Circus Circus goes to like fifty two floors or something, and we're on the like the top floor. And we're leaving like it's super. We're both on edge. We're not like speaking to each other. We're in the elevator. It's packed. Everyone's like this shoulder to shoulder. Like t tensions are high, and every floor it stops to get somebody on, and the elevator's already packed. And about like the ninth time down, she goes. And there's like, we're in here and there's like 60 year old grandmas next to me and a little four year olds next to me on the other side. And she goes, fuck, like his loud shit. And I'm like, oh my God, bro. Like, so, and then done, I was done with her right away. So yeah, I was, I would run, right? If a girl like swore, cause I've never, I've never raised my voice to a woman. I've never cussed at a woman before. Like I just had, I, because I'm so the opposite direction because of what I saw, um, that's very important to me that I have a relationship, which is, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of relationships that lasted very long because of that. Because when you're young and 20, you do a lot of dumb stuff. But I ended up finding a girl like Katrina, which is she's like a master communicator, which is amazing. You know? I think that builds such an awareness. Like I've been on the other side of that in a sense where this happened recently. I was going through a bunch of like legal bullshit and Tess was just in the room. And she has like some, I don't know, I'm not going to put her, her laundry out there, but I was on a phone call with some people and I was irate at them in the other room was very like disconnected, but totally forgot that she was even there. And I sailed my hand right through the Ikea desk in this Airbnb, pounded fist and just smashed the, like Hulk smashed the desk and it's fucking PDF Mondo <laughs> press board bullshit. It's not like some Bruce Lee feat of strength or anything like that. <laughs> but like I finished the call like hours later, had totally forgot about smashing the desk that my table was on. Cause I was so mad about this conversation I was having. And I walked out later and like, you know, she was kind of like, oh my God, like this guy's insane. Like this, and it's, it was completely compartmentalized and I'm, like you would never raise my voice or anything like that. But I'm like, oh, like I lacked a, there was a serious lapse of awareness on my part where I didn't even think that this girl I just started dating is in the other room while the lunatic boyfriend smashes it like it's an Aerosmith after party or something, starts breaking furniture. And ever since then I was like, okay, like, there has to be an awareness of like, even when you don't think people are here in the same way that, you know, your, your parents and my friends who were acquaintances that were running Hollywood rails up their nose when their two year old was around. It's like, Oh, they're <laughs> downloading this. Yeah. Oh it's, yeah. It's funny. Like in my experience growing up, like if you watch the Simpsons, my dad is like Homer Simpson, angry dad, <laughs> like my dad. And he'll probably listen to this fucking podcast. One of the two people that listen for me, but like my dad is Homer Simpson. Like he will trip over every fucking thing. He's got the two pieces of hair on the top of his head. But like when I was a kid, my dad kicked our fence down because he walked into it the wrong way. Like he walked into the pull side and thought it was a push and it didn't open. So he just booted it right off the hinges. He got a hatchet stuck in the shed by throwing it. 
he smashed more of those see-through VTech phones they advertised on right. Hockey Night in Canada than you could imagine, <laughs> just smashing them off the ground because he'd get in like an automated operator and he's like, I need a human and he'd just fucking bash it. But like, I grew up with that, but I'd also grew up with him and my mom getting in these things on a Monday. Like my mom would do something and I could, I'd watch and I'd see him in his own autistic little way, start to get upset. And then it would calm down. And I was like, dude, Saturday, 2 PM, this guy's lighting it up. And I would just wait. <laughs> Saturday, 2 PM comes around. My mom does something, says she's fine. And that's it. Like my dad's going through the screen door. He's out in the street, no shoes on, breaking garden tools. And what I took from that, like kind of just funny, listen, you talk about it, Adam, and like what you've understood later on in life is now when I have a problem, like with a partner or with somebody, I just immediately, I'm like, Hey, I didn't like that. I need to talk about it. Mm. And I'm just so direct. I'm like that thing you did. I don't like it. Like I want to sit down. I want to tell you why I didn't like it. And we could just discuss if I'm even being irrational. Well, I right. think, and the thing I wanted to get, carry this conversation into was, and I'm learning this now and, you know, having a business for five or six years where with business partners and all that, like the one thing that I've always admired about the mind pump organization and admire more and more is like you, you have a, a, a filter over ro like romantic relationships, right? You would have an apprehension of like, you know, you know, this chick popped off. We were playing Call of Duty, boom, headshot. And then all of a sudden she's up my fucking grill. Peace. Pack your shit, bitch. Where it's like, you're on the lookout for that. Like you're looking for certain qualities for someone that you want to spend the rest of your life with. But like, I, at least when I entered into business, I'm like, I want to make some money. This seems fun. There's no real money on the table. There's an opportunity. There really wasn't the same vetting process for like starting a bit. And I'm super lucky that my buddy Jenta is he was a good dude and we both didn't really have a vetting process. I'm sure he's cursing up a storm about how stupid I am, but that's, that's like a marriage. And I was told that 100%. out of the gate, but I, like, I've been in and out of marriages. I've been almost in and out of my own business. So it's like, how is it that that communication or is it more difficult or less difficult? Cause you're in a romantic, I mean, not a romantic relationship. I don't know. Doug is looking pretty good these days, but like <laughs> you've been in a relationship with, with Sal, with Justin and with Doug for how I many? How many guys? Seven years? Yeah, yeah. We're approaching. We're we're on six. We're six, six and a half, right? And if you don't, if you could probably count some of the time of us courting before, right? And I 100% agree with you that uh, it's absolutely uh, a marriage, and arguably um, more difficult, right? And I'm sure a lot of married people will will disagree with that. Uh, but if you ever built something to this magnitude with four other partners. Uh, I would argue that that uh, because there's just there's money involved, dude. I mean, mm -hmm. there, and it's you and it's from the very get go, especially when you have four four guys that are all serial entrepreneurs by themselves, like that have gone off and done their own well before we all got together. It, it takes a it takes a massive amount of humility to be able to get all. And there, I mean, I would be lying to you if I told you that it was all roses, bro. I mean, there was there's, I mean, Sal and I had some so. I, I wish that we had it because it would be nostalgic to look back like, you know, down the road at, with the success it's had and everything go like, man, I remember those days when we used to fight about this and we used to do that. Like the thing, though, that the glue, right, is the uh, the respect that we always had from each other from the very from the very get go. Right. There was this this mutual respect for everybody as an individual before the marriage even happened. So, and I think that's really important even in a marriage, right? So a lot of people, they, they fall in love or lust or, and they, and they, or they, there's something that they are so attracted to and then they just work it out versus like, is this really like somebody that's a, a true partner or do I really love everything about them, right? I, we all kind of had that. So when we want, run into these situations where we would argue about things, it, it was always for the betterment of the business, right? So it was always about, um, moving forward, just like a team, right? And you know, because you got your mm -hmm. athletes, so you know what this is like too, right? Like, I bet you some of the best teams you played on, there was some some rubbing back and forth, right? Two captains that thought one we should go one way or the other way, and aggressive and hard, or calling each other out when they're not pulling their weight. But that yet, then there's still that respect for each other. That man, this I love this dude because he gets up and grinds on his own on his own time when I'm doing my own thing, and so it's like you go to war with each other. We had that same kind of that camaraderie with each other going into the business and respect for each other. And we do, we call it, I mean, if, some, if someone's slipping or someone's not pulling their weight or they're fucking up, still to this day, we have those, what we call come to Jesus meetings where we'll sit down and say, yo, hey, here, what's going on with you, man? 
Like it ain't like you to not be doing this or not be doing that. And and, and a lot of this too is probably our age where we're at. You know, we're we're all I'm the youngest at almost forty. You know, Doug's in his fifties, Sal's in his mid forties, Justin's early forties. Like we're we're patient. It's like the father, it's like the parent thing that I was talking about before we started this podcast is, you know, we all have this kind of patience of you know, no one lets their ego get in the way. Um, we all want to win. We all want to win so bad that it we don't matter. Like the egos have dissolved. And like and again, referring back to sports because I love to use sports analogies. Those the, if you've ever been on a team that like crushes, that's one of the common things. Is like everyone's a killer, but they ain't nobody care about being the man. Like they're all willing, which is I love. Why, like, I hate watching, like, the Lakers win games. I love watching, like, Warriors or the, the underdog, you know, the team that, like, comes together and just moves the ball well and sacrifices for the other guy. doesn't care about the points. Like, my favorite players are people like Iguodala, mm-hmm. Draymond Green, people that, like, don't need, like, to be the man or, you know, be told that they're one of the greatest players to ever play the game. I think, that, like, if you, like, and people will fucking flip when I say this. I think Draymond Green is one of the greatest players in the NBA right now. And like people are like, what? But it's how he plays the game. I agree. You know? Selfless. Well, the crazy thing to me was you like, and I was I had a very peripheral understanding of what podcasting even was. I, I mean, I told the story when Sal was on a few weeks ago and it's like how I got connected with you guys through Craiger. And like, I was just kind of getting, uh, Craig brought me to like LA Fit Expo. We were like going behind the body armor booth with Mike O'Hearn. And I saw Victor Martinez, like, oh, I used to smoke weed with Vic out in New York. I'm like, oh, this is like, this is the fitness industry. This is Mm. crazy. And then podcasting and meeting you guys. And to hear you say that specifically, because I, my only measuring stick of success at this point in the fitness industry was an Instagram following. Mm-hmm. And you were still, when I met you, we went to Yard House in Santana Row, right? It was with my ex-wife, Katrina was there. And it was me, you, uh, it was, Craiger was there with his wife. And then we had dinner and you were still IFBB pro, you know, you were still in the middle. And I thought, oh, this guy is this guy is the this guy's the one who wants the rock. He's the he's the star player. He's the one who is gonna carry this team. Like he's the guy in the clutch. But then to hear you say that, being like, no, nah, there's no like there's no winners. It is the collective. It is towards the goal. And be like, yo, I, I I fuck with Draymond and things like that. My my favorite moment, like so, one of the most common questions like I get asked now, like when I get interviewed, is like when was when was the moment like you felt in this business like you made it. Like when like, okay, we've reached this like level, right? Of like real success. And the story I tell and is this, is that I got a call from, uh, my sister runs customer service on the back end. So she fields about a hundred emails a day of people that are going through our programs and stuff like that. And she answers questions and we build out templates in HubSpot to, to try to build towards AI right now. So she's got a very important job and she works full time behind the scenes and nobody knows who she is. And she she sends or she shows me this email that she's having she's going back and forth with this lady because I can oversee everything through HubSpot so I can see her communication with people. And this lady has already bought like I think three programs with us so she's I think she spent about two hundred and something dollars invested in the company over the last like seven or eight months. And the lady's asking a question I don't remember exactly what it was I think it was revert something about her knees bothering her or something and Cassie refers to something I said uh, on a podcast recently, like, oh, you know, did, you know, Adam was saying, referred to this on the podcast, blah, blah, blah. And she kind of basically regurgitated what I said. And the lady sends back, who the hell is Adam? And that was the moment when I realized that, okay, we've arrived because this business is bigger than, than me. And that's what I, the goal for all of us was always that, was that can we build something that doesn't require any of us Mm -hmm. and it's very successful and and people get tremendous value from it because the ultimate goal for us was to remove ourselves you know so the we and we this is a a, a conversation that we always have is that you know one day i mean now you and i are friends and we text so you'll you'll always have contact with me but one day i'm going to disappear one day you're going to turn instagram one day you're going to turn instagram on and i'll and i'll just poof gone overnight like that and you and you're going to be like what the fuck and it, and it won't matter. It won't yeah. affect my pocket. And and I will never have to turn shit on or dance like a monkey for everybody on fucking Instagram. And we're out. 
That's that, a goal. That's all of our goal. That's such a distant horizon. Cause like I attributed, I mean, I'm nowhere near where we want this to go. Obviously yeah. like we have an empty shelf in a brand new studio and like we, we just got a door handle today, which was a big investment for us. But like, <laughs> I remember starting to be like, oh, this is, this is something now when I started to get recognized. We're like, I've, when I was in a country and I didn't have to start paying gym drop-in fees and I would insistently give my credit card. Like, oh no, like, and you know what it was? I saw you on a Mind Pump YouTube video. Go ahead, go work out. of like, oh, bet. But that was for me, it was like, oh, cool. Like, I don't know what it is, but this might be on the way. And you're like at such a distant horizon. We're like, no, 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 I don't want to be, I want to be the voice behind the thing. I want to show up, record my shit, go play with my kids and then take off and be gone. Which is so crazy we, to me because so many people in the industry, it's so driven by narcissism, recognition, instant gratification. And you're like, yo, just like, as long as I got the bag at the end of the day, like, yeah. I don't give a fuck. That's kind of, I was actually, uh, I was actually, I was yelling at the guys yesterday about this, dude. Like, we're talking about heated argument, right? Doug left, so I can, I'm going to go into this because he won't listen to this shit. He's not got time to listen to this stuff. So I'll talk some shit right now. Oh, there's Doug right now. So I'm going to tell him, any, I'll tell the story, anyways. <laughs> oh I'm going to air everybody's laundry right here. So, Yesterday, I uh, I was I was kind of lighting every everybody up. We had a, a big one of those come to Jesus means we're all talking about where we're all at, and and this has been an, this has been a problem or the, a problem of ours or what I said is our Achilles heel. So when we first started the podcast way back when, we waited to leave all of our other jobs until we were making enough money that everybody could like afford to do that. And I didn't want us to do that. I wanted us to be fucking poor and hungry and yeah. scared. Get it, I want and, and I was con I was and and of course I was at that time I was a guy not married no kids so that was the pushback I got like yeah of course you do buddy you know what I'm saying you can afford to do that we all and so I lost that bet but I always said to them that this will be this will come back to haunt us mm -hmm. because there's going to be times in this business when we're trying to scale to a new level and we're always so comfortable and we're in and we're in another one of those places right now for us. We're very we're very comfortable where we're at with our little schedule and how things are going and everything's automated. And we all have we have ambitions to this this even crazier level. It's 10x to where we're at right now. And I looked at everybody and said, "We're not going to get there. Not like this. If you are if we are all in this room doing the same shit that we're doing right now in 5 years, we will be making the same money or less." And one of my biggest fear is that there's four other dudes just like us that saw what we built and what we're doing that are a lot hungrier than we are, that are going to learn from all of our mistakes, emulate what we're done and do it better than us. And they're going to fucking gobble us up if we don't learn to scale out of our positions. I said, my ultimate goal is that it because everyone and Sal always likes to say how the, the podcast is our baby and that's everything and this and that. And I could no, I don't mm -hmm. think that way. I want to remove myself from that. I said that now that might be the last thing that we pull ourselves out of because it's what we are most known for. And it is like the catalyst that continues to grow or drive this ship. But it does not mean I 100 percent believe there is a younger, better looking, smarter version of myself out there that can get on this mic and do it better than me. It's probably and, me. And, and <laughs> it's right. Right. So and you know what? I want to be in a position where I come to you and be like, hey, how much money? You make? Cool. I'm going to pay you four times what you're making right now. Come sit in my chair. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I can remove myself from that. But the point of me saying that to them is that it's the only way that you can scale. You've got to You've got to learn what you're currently doing. You, and that's a very difficult thing for entrepreneur, successful entrepreneurs to do because we, we get we fall in love with like the way we do everything. And, and it's and, I, and this is what I was saying. I was like, listen. It's not out of laziness that I remove myself from these positions and I let somebody else do it. You think I ever thought for a minute that Taylor could run the partnership side of the business as good or better than me? Fuck no. Nobody can run it as good as I can. But that, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with knowing that he's as long as he can keep it going and I can develop him over time, it allows me to move away from that, now focus on another side of the business. And, you, and you're seeing me do that on the real estate side of the business right now. And you've seen me do that on other aspects of this business where I help build it up and then I, then I get somebody else to run it and then I remove myself from it and I'm on to the next thing. And it's one of our Achilles heels is that we all get caught up. Like Sal Love, like he writes almost all of our content and he's very particular about 
what gets put out there because it's it's on our name, which I, I love that, respect that that's important. But at some point, he's got to let go of that and let somebody else. Justin, he's so hung up on the branding, the way everything looks and wants to be, okay, well, that's great. And that's got us to this point, but he's got to let it go. Some other person's going to come in there and do it and maybe they won't do as good of a job. Doug, like with all the producing stuff, he's got his hands in the bookkeeping, the producing. He's the hardest, like, because he's been a one-man show for his entire life. He, he clings on to every aspect of the business. And I'm like, listen, and if you guys are okay with this, if you want to make the money we're making right now, we got great freedom, we got great livelihood, everything's cool. I'm just tell me right now if this is where we're all going to be. If we're all going to be okay with this, then tell me now. But I'm pushing for that next level, and I'm trying to get us to be there. And I'm telling you right now, we aren't the way we're running right now. The way we're running right now, we're still doing a lot too much, and we got to get to a point where we're always trying to scale ourselves out of that posi- out of that position. Well, I think the hard part is it's not necessarily better or worse, right? Like I know for a fact that like web design right now, we're looking at retainers for web design and graphic design. It's like, what am I gonna go in Canva for seven hours, pop three Adderall and watch a bunch of YouTube tutorial videos? But I'd fucking do it and I've done it because it's not so much a quality thing as who can do the job better, but who, who will care more, mm-hmm. right? And that's always it for me is like that relinquishing of that control. It's so hard to find people who will care as much as you. Right, like they, we were talking about this movie Pool Hall Junkies before. There's a famous line in that movie where it's like, people will work as hard enough so they don't get fired and you pay them enough so they don't quit, right? Yeah. So when it's your own jam and like ascending out of your comfort zone, it's like your biggest thing to kind of make the child analogy. It's like, like no one will ever care much about me as my mother or my father or my sister because that's kind of family. But there, there are people who would do a better job in managing me, no doubt. Right, but like the relinquishing of that control is probably comes down to not necessarily a quality, but like, like how much people are in it, how invested are they emotionally? Because how much have you guys? I could only imagine how many late nights, how many come to Jesus arguments, how many maybe almost come to blow arguments. Mm-hmm. Like Jent has grabbed me by the throat before. <laughs> All five foot six, hundred and seventy cauliflower. Your motherfucker just reached out to me once. Like that's the last time you talked to me like that. And I was like, yo. And then, but that was a breakthrough moment for me. Mm-hmm. I was like, let's go. This is what I'm looking for. I want a guy who will take it there. Yeah. Like, let's take it to the fucking mat. Because it shows me you care enough. Like, you have a line in the sand that you won't cross. So it, it's it's hard. I mean, I could imagine at your level, because, like, that's what everyone was after, right? Comfort. Like, you guys talk on the internet about fitness and lifestyle and all that. And seven years ago, you guys were in a fucking broom closet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that it's that's the dance, right? Like, because you're right. It's something that... in that, and it's give and take. Like that again, why we're so why we're all so good together, right? Because I tend to be the one that's always trying to push us further. Sal's probably the one who's always trying to like slow me down and be like, calm down, you know. Like I I care I care about my family and my kids as much as I care about dominating the fitness industry. So, you know, I I'm not gonna sacrifice all of that. I'm too old for that shit. It's not just about money for me. So there's a nice little ebb, but at the same time too, he agrees. Like I want to dominate. I want to crush. Like. So there, there's this nice little push-pull relationship that we have. So it works. It really does. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a really neat dynamic. But I do think that, um, you know, there's levels to this game. And when in every level, there's different challenges. And the, the, the current level that we are at is exactly what happens when you get four pretty badass entrepreneurs that all come together, finally figure their shit out, build something really cool together. But now they have to look even beyond that. Like, okay... Okay, now how all these things that I built, these babies that I have, because we have like all these little, we have multiple children within this business, right? There's many arms. I mean, there's three companies, right? You have Mind Pump Investments, you got uh, Maps Fitness Products, and then you have Mind Pump Media, and they all they all are their own their own entity. And then they, within them, there's all kinds of lines of revenue that are coming into all of them, and people running different sides. And when you created that from nothing. You, you have this affinity for it and you don't and you don't want to let it go or you don't want to hand it over to someone who cares less than you do. But if you want to keep going, you, you, you have to break free of that at one point and knowing which things to break free of and where to, to, to put your time. And then also one of the most important things is knowing when to say what to say no to, because you do you get to this point and there's always an opportunity. There's always somebody who's like, yo, we should do this together and you can, we can make all this and we can do that. Like there's, that's always happening and you got to know 
what to not not to not to get distracted by that shit and stay stay the course. And people, it's always people who make those hand gestures when they yeah. pro- when they propose the ideas. Yeah. It's always this. It's like you're always getting sold <laughs> Yo, by like the yeah, yeah. Uh, like the fat Albert cartoon <laughs> yeah. guy with the hat up on the top of his head. Uh, now, how do you now? Like I know we've been lucky enough to have been in Mind Pump Studios. Like I I, I can't count how many times I've been in there. And it's like you walk into that office and it's it's a beautiful mind. It's like Goodwill Hunting's bathroom mirror. There's just yeah. fucking equations and yeah. whiteboards and numbers. When you reach this impasse, when you reach this crossroads rather, and you have to make a decision of like, you know, do we chop the nose off to spite the head? Do we chop off the tail to save the body? Is it is it data driven or is it emotionally driven? Is it instinctually driven? Like when you have to make these decisions to maybe sacrifice for the better of you know the company or the arm of the company, how much do you rely on instinct and how much do you rely on like data and you know numbers and? Well, so that's a be- that's another beauty of the the team that we've built too, right? So <clears throat> now another uh, so my uncle runs the marketing side of the business, right? So and he is a uh, analytical monster. And he is not a fitness guy. He don't give a shit about what I'm doing. This guy's been, he's helped, was part of Pac Bell and the Yellow Pages. And he's been in advertising for 40 years of his life. And he is the absolute pit bull. He's like all the extreme versions of me. That's who he is. Like, and he is like, he's like a hard person to work with, uh, but perfect for what I need him to do. And so he keeps our, the instinct and our love and our passion, like, cause there is, there's like the, our gut tells us like, oh, this is where we should go. And this feels right. And then he'll be like, oh, no, it's not. The numbers don't say that. I don't give a shit what you guys think. This is wrong. This is a bad idea. Now I work for you. So if you want me to go do this, I'll go do it. Now there was a lot of like, at the beginning when we first brought him on, like what, three, almost three years ago now, there was a lot of push and pull back and forth, you know, especially uh, from like Sal, Sal's very uh, love gut, you know, like that's his his direction. My uncle's very analytical. I like to say, I like to think I'm a little bit in the between, maybe a little bit more towards my uncle. So I would tr- try and be that voice of, of reason between the two of them. Um, but it, the fact that I have them both is very important because there's some things that that Sal always makes sure that we we keep our North Star and like we run with integrity, right? Where my uncle would just be like, you know, whatever to, to win and make money. Like, so that could be dangerous if you just took his advice all the time. And we know better than that, right? So having someone like Sal, who's always very, very integrity driven and is like, that doesn't feel right, dude. Like, I know we're going to make more money doing this and it's a guy, it's a huge opportunity for us, but I don't want to be known for that. Or I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to tarnish who we are in our name just to, to make a million dollars. And so he makes a very good balance for the two of them. But then at the same time, too, there's times when Sal's gut tells him we should do this. And then I, I have the numbers to support that, like, nah, bro, it's as much as it feels right and you like it, like, we try to make money, too. So that's not a good idea. Well, I want to dig in on that point. And, like, kind of we were talking a little bit beforehand about some guests that you guys have had on. And just to, just to show the level of exposure you guys have outside of the hardcore fitness, Mind Pump Mafia, you know, throwing your pre-workout out and all this, the crazy early day fans. I Like, have you guys ever had points of contention around the integrity side with guests? Like this guy would be huge kick to, like I was on flagrant of, uh, last month and I had to go back and forth with Schultz on the title of the podcast. And Schultz just doesn't give a fuck. Schultz was like, he literally sent me the podcast title and it was steroids, everything you need to know with muscle doc, Dr. Jordan Shallow. I was like, bro, no and he's like it'll get the most clicks i'm like yo i gotta get through to this thing that like it's not about clicks this is my livelihood man like that might get you yeah. the most clicks but that might give me the most heat and he's like ah, it'll get the most clicks and i was like oh man like i don't feel comfortable with that he's like okay but I, he came up with a new title and then i was like okay but even after that he's like that won't get as many clicks how have you guys had issues with that as far oh, yeah. as like guests is there anything you guys haven't aired anything points of so- contention uh, there's, we've aired everything, right, Doug? There's nobody we haven't not aired, right? Right. Yeah, we've aired, uh, a couple interviews weren't so great, so we didn't air. Inter- yeah, so air I had those. I, don't, but... I won't roll under the bus. Like one, of, it's because I like the guy. He's a nice kid. We'll talk about there. Yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's you actually probably know who he is. He's probably reached out to you. He's got a name. He's 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 tied to. Uh, He's tied to quite a few people, and uh, he kind of he kind of weaselled his way on the show pretty well. 
Um, uh, and I have I have uh, this soft spot for somebody who I think is like a good closer or like does a good job of closing me. Like by the way mm -hmm. they do it, like you know what I'm saying. And he did a good job, and so yeah, come on on, bro. And uh, we we got going on the interview, and I thought because this person it works with professional people and stuff that you know he's going to be like high level. And I'm going to write down who I think it is, and I'm going to show you <laughs> after. <laughs> so. Uh, we anticipated like this to be like, you know, a high level professional, you know, coach type of conversation. And like within like five minutes of like you see all three of us like looking at each other going like, oh, this fool don't know nothing he's talking about right now. Like, oh, shit. And so we kind of carry the conversation and keep it going and stuff. So watch it's me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, you're stupid. No, this never aired. So this this never aired. And I had to tell him like, hey, bro, just didn't work out wasn't wasn't good we didn't we didn't air it so that's only that's the only one i could think of that didn't air and it was my mistake because i didn't i didn't read i didn't read the situation very well and, and everybody and but you know and to like um sal and this is sal i would have probably aired it i almost was like ah fuck it put it out there and just, we'll let everybody else you know call him out and shit on his bullshit but sal's like no because we didn't mm -hmm. he goes because we didn't call him out and we knew better and we made this mistake early way back when way even before i think you and i met the first like uh, Instagram person we had, we had a, a, a kid um, from the uh, um, uh, the Bachelor come on, and he had a quarter million followers. We thought this was going to be our first like big exposure thing, which it wasn't oh at my all. Gosh. Was it and Ben? A, yeah, 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 hilarious. Yeah. God love yeah. the Silicon Valley. Yeah, bro, good kid too, yeah. right? Good kid, but just uh, not nowhere near any of our level of being a trainer. And because he was, we were so young and new mm -hmm. and we were just so happy to have somebody who had a bigger following than us in there we allowed him to talk about fitness and like say things that we were all just like well, that's fucking wrong you know, but we didn't <laughs> but, but we didn't call it out you know yeah. because we were too nervous to, to hurt his feelings or to we, we we were we were too courteous to our guest early on and so we didn't call bullshit out so that um that's where we're doing now we have a guest coming up by the way and, and this i'm trying to move us in this direction of actually getting more guests that we disagree with like so i had the ceo of tonal come on after i did that whole tonal post did oh, you see shit. my my post on yeah. talking shit about tonal yeah so i, I had the ceo come in so and we weren't we weren't easy like i i definitely like we all did we all because uh, that was the deal it was like hey I, I called them out on instagram yeah. and we all stood behind what we said that we think it's overvalued and stuff like that and now the ceo is willing to come on and so we all kind of had a little pep talk, like we are not going to let this be a be nice. I like I would rather us err on being assholes and then never air it than us let him get away with saying something that we disagree with. And so I thought we did a really good job. That interview will come out in like a week or two. And I thought um, we asked really hard questions. We disagreed where we disagreed. And so I felt good about it. But in the past, um, yeah, we wouldn't even bring somebody on of that. But what to your point about the marketing stuff, this has been um, a major growth area for us, like to find the middle ground of what my marketing team wants us to label things and title stuff, uh, and then like us keeping our integrity, kind of like what you're, where you feel challenged. And so we've, we've kind of found this middle ground, right? Because nothing goes more viral and, then, and searched than when we do some stupid catchy, t like the 10 fastest ways to lose fat, yeah. which like literally is the like, why we built this show was to like call out all the gimmicky shit like that. And so we were very resistant to that for a long time of like titling things that way. But over time and a lot of pushing and pulling back and forth, we kind of found this middle ground. Okay. How can we keep our integrity and deliver what we think is the correct message and very mind pump esque, but then at the same time, give these idiots these titles that are going to make them click because well, here's the tr truth. They won't click on it. If you don't have that stuff, what I was going to say was it's kind of like, you're the direct antidote in a way. It's like, if that's the vehicle that gets it to those people, then it's like, you're, it's always goes back to the intention behind the act, right? Like I think like people vocalize and communicate in different ways, but it's like, if you have to title your uh, content, 10 fastest ways to lose fat, but they come to you guys and they're getting real information that matters. It was better. They clicked on you than the next guy lifting fake plates with 4 million views. Well, well yeah, that's a clickbait and switch. Yeah. yeah. You guys are perfect. And like, and then you think of some of these titles and I even remember in the early days, because whenever I did mind pump YouTube stuff, it was always me and Adam. Cause we had, we had the longest relationship and we would sit there 
and we, he's like, what do you got for his shoulders? And mm -hmm. like, there's four steps to shoulder health or something on a mind pump yeah. YouTube. But there was a yeah. discussion that we had before. And he's like, look, man, like, how can we, how can we elevate this? Like, how can we make this essentially like the clickbait and switch and make it a deeper thought process? Yeah, because the truth is that I mean, what is uh, the the average keeps going down, right? They they say that what the it takes uh, I think five seconds now is the, mm -hmm. the attention span. That so you got like five seconds to convince somebody, and, and and that does not play well for guys like us that are communicators, especially Jordan. I mean, Jordan can't even put a sentence together; it doesn't take a minute to like you know decipher all the big words that he puts together, right? Yeah. So, so to, you know, that's just does not, that's not how we communicate, even us, right? Like I need mm. to explain myself and give you the depends, right? And then the counter yeah. to that, right? And so it's really tough, but you, you, you got to fight fire with fire. If you, if we are going to outsell or outbring more people or get more people to come into our network, we've got to kind of play that game a little bit. So where we got okay with it is that as long as we, when we started the podcast, we would say things like, listen, Nothing is fast about losing fat. Or even if you did lose fat really fast, it's going to backfire on you. And mm -hmm. let me tell you why. And then we would. And then, so as long as we kept integrity about the message, and to your point you made right before I started talking, is that is exactly that, right? Because there's people that go, here's the 10 fastest ways. Drink one gallon of water, take this, do that. And they're, they're now that's what we don't like. Like that's mm -hmm. bullshit. That's bad. And it's bad advice because nobody should be trying to lose that much weight that fast. And so if we can just articulate that in a, in a podcast, then we could, I feel okay about giving those titles out. And so, but that, there was a lot of contention there between the, the owners and the marketing team. And it, it was about almost, I want to say almost a year long fight of us like resisting that. And we, we kind of finally gave in to like trusting the process and saying, okay, you guys tell us what you want us to talk about and like, and they will give us like some, and it would be hard. Like give us the, you know, the best workout for women to do this. And I'm like, Oh my God, like that, those, those things are just rough, but we've learned to use what they, they, cause they have all the analytics to go. Like my, my uncle has the access to go, what are the, the 10 most searched things this month around fat? And there, and there's literally t tool software that'll say like how to lose fat in my stomach. And it'll give you like the top five. And if you can bring a title, that's related exactly to the, the, those five most searched things related to fat. That shit's going to fly. It will go. People will click on it. So that's to piss off the fitness hardcore in lieu of going out to broader borders and bringing a better message is one thing and one level of integrity. You guys did something recently that could have had huge backlash and way more exposure. You guys mm -hmm. had Brian Callen on the podcast yeah in the middle of like i would say still we're still in the, maybe the eye of the storm of the look at that face look at that face that motherfucker the, in the middle of the cancel culture storm you and meme dad sal de stefano went out and got like someone who got canceled i was like yeah. was that a risk because not only like whatever you piss off some mind pump mafia guy who's about the hardcore thing with three easy steps to whatever and you know the clickbait and switch routine but this is going out, you're going out into no man's land with a guest like that. Because you're potentially bringing, like you're potentially bringing an audience to the podcast that's not already like an early adopter, right? Like that yeah. attention could be from people that don't know you guys. Yeah, I I think that we're, and we, so there's there's this, this is one of my things I love about my partners now too, like, you know, back to the sports analogy. Like when you've been playing, you know, hockey or basketball with somebody long enough, you get to a place where, like I don't even need to know where where Sal is, and I, I I can throw the ball behind my back, not even and know that he's right there, right? Because we've we've done this enough. So when we're when we're navigating the waters of like a conversation like that, and I never know if he's if he's gonna take the lead on being the asshole or the guy who's gonna push the boundary with like the political stuff and what side he's gonna take. Matter of fact, we had a pot, an interview or a conversation today. I, I'm excited for this to release. This will go what fri Friday's episode or Monday's episode? That one we just had today, Doug. Friday. So Friday's episode, we got into a, a, a heated battle. What was the topic about? What were we arguing about? What was it? We were, we were arguing back and forth about something. Was that the straight arm? No, 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 no. The other thing that we were getting hard about that was more, um, uh, it was more political. It was about oh, Lane Norton getting canceled. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Lane, Lane, Norton, did you see Lane Norton got his his stuff all blocked? And so wait, now did you see, again? Yeah, just for yeah, what? He, oh, dude, yeah, drop this. Yeah, so recently he got he got uh, sent a warning and, and f like his account frozen. They're saying that they're going to shut him down, and he freaked out. 
And so, uh, and I didn't know going into this car, this, this just naturally happened in conversation. And this is kind of the Brian Callen point and like how this works with us is uh, Sal, even though I probably really agree with Sal uh, a lot in like, I will take the counter argument mm -hmm. um, and I'll do it passionately. So, and, and this was a little difficult for me at first because I, I, I have to be the, sometimes the bad guy all the time or the, you know, the least liked one out of us because, you know, Sal is taking a very smart angle and he is right, but I know that this is important that I take the other side and I will dig my heels in and make it really difficult for him. But it, I think that's the, the beauty of it because I force him to really articulate his point and to explain himself and his thought process and I present a challenging argument. That's, this is this beautiful weave that we have when we have these conversations is – he, if I see him going a direction, and I know it's going to be something like you know cancel culture, culture, which we know is going to be crazy. Some people on one side, I will take the other side, or he will. Like sometimes I, if I get emotional about something and I come out hard on something, he'll make sure he takes the other side. So the so we represent both sides of the argument, even if both of us kind of agree one way or the other. We do a really good job of naturally kind of arguing with each other so that the audience has like that other point and they can go uh, and it, and it, it's why they're why the the fans are so so divided mm -hmm. there is definitely sal fans oh yeah. justin fans and adam fans and they're and a lot of times and there's of course there's people that love the show right that enjoy all of us and they think we're just great damn it but there is definitely people that would like you know, if Sal wasn't on the show, I would not listen to it. You know, to listen to Adam's bullshit and him, to, uh, like, I would never just listen to him. So there's definitely people who we have, him and I have very polarizing personalities. You either love us or hate us, but because you have somebody, one of us three, you identify with, you tend to tune in and you'll listen to the other guy's bullshit because you feel like Sal, Sal's going to put him in his place in a minute here. He's going to tell Adam that he's full of shit, you know, or vice versa, you know, somebody mm -hmm. who like, is always happy to hear me argue with Sal about something. So it's it's a it's a beautiful flow that I think that we've perf I wouldn't say we've perfected, but we've we've gotten better at it over time. And it's it's cool to see. I love when it happens. I, it, like today, it was after we hang those up. There's not a lot of these episodes. Where, oh, that was that was fun. That was good. When we have a good argument and we we take and every, each guy is taking good good opposing sides like really well. Um, I, those do the best. Those are I, we get the most comments and traction and people telling us like oh my wife and i were debating what you guys were saying and you're or they'll dm me like privately like sal's so wrong about that and he gets the same shit you know like adam's such an idiot you know <laughs> so it's like then they don't think that we fucking tell each other you know of course we do you know we do <laughs> we share that shit all the time <laughs> now in the seven years you've been doing this what are the ones that jump off the page like you guys are what almost two thousand are you new over two thousand episode 1700 where are you guys at yeah i think we're at 17 1700 doug is that right 15 oh, 60 or something 15 like that. 60 something like that uh, which you got to have a short list that jump off the page <clears throat> um god you're it, it, i do uh, some that are are actually uh, are coming up like there's definitely been um i think i've told you this before every 200 shows we level up uh, this, and it's a weird, I don't know if it's exactly 200, but around 200, there there is this uh, mutual feeling that we all feel like, ooh, we hit a new notch. Like, the, we're, the conversation's flowing better, we're, we're speaking better, whatever. And so, you know, even though there was some great, like, you know, Paul Check interview was just, I mean, that guy... I got high with him and just like sit back and, <laughs> and let, let, back when I had hair, let him blow my hair back, you know, just, just had so much fun. Listen to his crazy mind work, you know? So, but I, I think newer stuff is way better. Like we have that, that tonal, uh, conversation is, is a really, it was a really fun, good conversation. I just had, uh, Peter Linneman, who's an economist who I really, really like. And I thought we had a really, really good conversation with him. Um, Bishop Barron was cool. It was a religious one, and so to to listen to somebody as at the, the the level of intelligence mm -hmm. that he had, I thought that was really really fun. Um, but I, I'm enjoying the stuff more recent uh, than anything in the past. So even though I, there's like these jump off the page memorable type of podcast, um, we are getting better with questions, and we, we still haven't arrived, dude. I really don't believe we we have fully arrived. There there's still I, I, I want us to get to a place where like we really make somebody uncomfortable because we, we ask such hard questions and I feel like we're getting there but we're not quite all the way there. The hilarious part to me and the reason I was laughing is um, I, I won't disclose the numbers on air, 
it was either you or Sal that reached out to me after the Bishop Barron episode. And so we host our podcast on Libsyn because that's what Adam told me and Doug told me to do. So that's what I did. And that's what we've been doing for years. And I th it may have been Sal, but I'll, I'll, maybe I'll go back and check my messages. Anyways, I get a text message from one of the Mind Pump guys going, hey, can you do me a huge favor? I was like, anything, like whatever you guys want. I'll fucking murder someone. I'll help bury the body. It's like if they ask for something, it's done. Can you check your Libsyn numbers this for last month? And like this was uh, years ago, so like they weren't nearly what they are now, but nowhere yeah. near where they they were at. And I like they're like, are they out of the ordinary? And like we've been growing consistently month over month since we started in the last like four or five years. And so it was a normal trajectory of growth for that month. I did I even did the math on the percentages. I was like, no, this is in line with like the growth we've been seeing. Hmm. And then there was a there was a, a disclosure of how many downloads they had. And I was like, holy fuck, that's a lot for a month, but it was actually for a day. That's insane. Yeah, and I was just like, I'm, so the Bishop Barrett one, and then that's what they attributed to. It's like, well, maybe it was just this, this potentially new audience from this Bishop Barrett. An act of God. Yeah. Act of God. Yeah, that, was a, that, was a first, that was the first time uh, we hit a, a six figure uh, download day, right? So the first time we were north of 100,000 downloads in a day. And it, it just seemed like it was like, whoa, where did that come from? Because it wasn't that long before that. We were like 50 to 70, like a, a peak would be like a 70. Then all of a sudden, boom, 100. And then we were like maintaining 100,000 plus downloads a day. And we were just all looking at each other like, what the fuck happened? And so I did. I think I, it was me. who I, I texted all of my friends, all my podcasting friends that like will share that information. I'm like, yo, check your lips and tell me if anything weird is happening because this was so abnormal for us. So, so yeah, when you talk about things like that, like – those were very memorable moments. Like when, when that happened, that was a cool, and it also taught us something, right? Because we almost didn't do that. We almost didn't do that interview because we're like, you know, the whole religious thing. And that's not our, that's not really our wheelhouse, but you know, we made this promise to ourselves. And it's why we named it mind pump was we didn't want to just stay in fitness. Like mm -hmm. if, if, if we were curious about it and we were interested in it, we should do it. And you know, it's, and it's a lesson I teach all other podcasters. Like, you know, don't let your don't let your audience, you know, your your core group, because we we used to do this a lot. It was a big mistake of ours. Like we have our core our forum, and they're your biggest buyers. So a lot of times you allow them to really dictate some of your decisions. Yeah. And it's like you know, oh, they they only want this or they say that. It's like nah, like if if you are passionate about something or you're curious about something, because a, 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 if you're curious about it, it makes for a good interview, especially intelligent guys like you, like. If you're curious about it, you're going to ask really good questions. And so it was a good lesson for us to remember that, like, don't be afraid to take on these interviews that, you know, you, if you asked your core, like if I asked my core, like, hey, I'm going to have this Peter Lineman economist on next week. What do you guys think? of like, what? Why? Like, I don't, that doesn't sound interesting to us at all. Well, that's because you're all fanatical fitness people and there's 3000 of you, but there's hundreds of thousands of people that are tuning in to us that are very interested about the economy and the prediction of like where real estate and the stock market is going on and what's going on with inflation. And like, I mean, I think that's a very, and very few people are not interested in that. And I'm extremely interested in that. And I spent a lot of time listening to stuff around that. So I've got a lot of questions. So yeah. I, I love that, you know, and, and those will do really, really well. That even for us, like, you, you know, we had our friend Marcus on and we did a podcast about like the three books all men should read. And Ooh, that's, that's completely cool. outside of fitness. And we all have very distinct uh, interests in literature. But I have people, that was over a year, 14 months ago. Yeah. I'll get five, 10 messages a week from people going, what episode was that? Like, I got to write those books down. I'm through two of them. Like, I need the next book. And these are abstract philosophy and fiction books. And I still have people weekly that tag me in their Amazon shopping carts of, some random book I mentioned to buy. And it's that idea. If we let the core group of guys who, you know, get off to the idea of externally rotating their shoulder, we're not going to sit around here and, you know, chew each other's dicks off talking about books, but. Well, it's, I mean, it's the same, it's the same mindset of comfort that they have within growing the business. Right. Yeah. Like, and I could see that being so like, potentially crippling because you're just going to, you know, here you have a guy who wants to walk away from the six figure daily download and just be like, oh, I'm done with podcasting because it has to be the next evolution. My hero. <laughs> but part of that too, being like, you, you know, you can't, but you can't possibly show a fear 
of a particular topic or guest, if this is going to be like those conversations can't coexist. I want to walk away from a podcast, but you know, I walk into a podcast studio. I don't want to talk about this because the people that still dry scoop their pre-workout will get mad at me. Like get the fuck out of here. Like those two right. things can't possibly exist in the same person or in the same business. Yeah, no. And I think we're, I think we're, you know, we're in this time right now when, uh, we're we're on one we're on a very extreme like the, when we talk about the cancel cor- culture and uh, everybody like just you know pick, hanging on every word you say and sensitive about everything and everything's got to be so PC. We've got and, and it, this is this is historical too. So you can look back and 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 see this is this is just human nature. The the young generation coming up always bucks the norm of now. Mm-hmm. So part of this PC culture cancel culture is a reflection of all of us crazy motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? And, and we and we probably needed to be corralled in a tiny bit, but they overcorrected. Mm-hmm. They overcorrected hard. And the next generation coming up, and, and you can see this already happening in, in with like TikTok and some of the stuff, like people are like getting, going crazy the opposite direction. So it's coming, like to balance us out a little bit. So I think we're in this overcorrection right now. And if you're, and I, and I feel sorry for the companies that are pandering to this this extreme movement because out of fear because they think they're going to mm-hmm. lose their business or they need to be, they need to fit in with everybody else because it ain't going to be long before it comes back the other direction and you're going to you're going to look like a pussy for doing that and I'd rather stay true to who we are and stick to the things that are our values and the things that we believe in even if it's kind of bucking the norm right now and not be afraid of those things because when it all washes out like I think you're going to be able to see the people who were just pandering and doing whatever, you know, what was popular at the moment. And I think that's going to hurt them in the, in the long run. Yeah, I'm right with you in the sense that I feel like that is that day is quickly approaching. That overcorrection is coming or if not here, man, like, you know, the, even words that we've said on the podcast that I probably wouldn't feel comfortable saying two years ago. I'm, you know, I'll say I'll say things on the podcast and I'll say, oh, shit, should we edit that out? And there's no reverberation because I, mm-hmm. I feel like the more absurd it gets, people think it's getting further away from us. I'm like, no, no, this is this is smoke now. Like my friend got in it. She called another girl a cow for like breaking some sort of contract. And she got like brutalized. And it was terrible. It wasn't like, obviously I thought it was fucking hilarious. But I was like, and people are like, oh my God, look how, look how bad it's getting. That like something as small as like a passing comment like that. And like, I know the intention behind the person. I'm like, I know that it's not necessarily bullying. Like there was no hate in that person's heart, but people took it and piled on and piled on and piled on. And then everyone looks at that and goes, oh man, it's getting out of hand. I'm like, nah, this is, this is running on fumes. This is where we're at right now. Like there was some stuff, like you said, that probably had to get corrected. Sure. There was some things, some excluded, marginalized group of society that needed to be included. And when the dust settles, it'll be solidified in a new normal. But this stuff, this is this is this is fading out. And I think, large in part, to people who see a historical perspective, I think the interesting thing coming up is going to be everyone's getting let loose now too. Everyone's been cooped up inside for mm-hmm. years, especially in Canada, like better part of 18, 20 months. And I think there's going to be an economic resurgence. I think there's going to be people are just going to be getting out and there's going to be like the roaring 50s all over again. Right. Well, I, yeah, that's a, that's a fear of some economists. Right. So do you here's a co- crazy stat for you guys. So um, the over the last three decades, the the average savings of uh, the United States is three trillion dollars, give or take. Over the last three decades, and if you looked at all the savings accounts in the entire United States, it averages about three trillion dollars, give or take a little bit, over the last three to four decades. You know where it's at right now, currently? Nine trillion. So there's three times the money mm-hmm. in people's bank accounts right now, as shitty of a time as it supposedly is right now, than there has ever been in the last four decades. So the people have people have more money right now than we ever have had before. Because of all this, I mean, what eighty percent of the money in circulation right now was printed in the last, you know, twenty four months. Yeah. So Buy there the is dip. Let's find so, the dip yeah. of that Dogecoin riding the yeah. wave. <laughs> so, yeah, man, we're we're. It, it sounds crazy to think that we're 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 gonna head into like some. I I mean, it we're, inflation is is here. I mean, it's it's coming. You can't you can't just get away with with printing that much money and not see it. So. Uh, you're going to see a lot of people spending money when this, and you see already that you, to your point about people getting out and like acting out, acting a fool. You see what's going on in the NBA, just like all these fans, like yeah. you know, pouring popcorn and just 
people were so pent up, dude. They're just acting crazy. They can't wait to get out and just acting a fool right now, yeah, man. It's, I, you got to bring Ron our test back. Yeah, dude. Ron Ron up on <laughs> yeah. But to, to, to Jordan's point about this idea of like people finally getting let loose, like I live in Toronto. We've been locked down since March 15th, basically, of last year. I think people have forgotten while they've been at home that universally people kind of suck. Well, that's my opinion. Like everybody's an asshole. It doesn't matter who mm -hmm. they are, but we've been locked inside and we're choosing sides with the people that we think need our defense until you walk out on the street and some bum grabs you by the hand and then immediately you hate everybody again because you live in a shit neighborhood. <laughs> so it's like, listen, once you go outside, you're going to realize everybody fucking sucks. And the playing field will be leveled. But we live in, and you mentioning the economy and us mentioning like the social economics, like we live in a society right now that I think is doomed to fail because people live in a buy low, sell high morality market where it's like, I'm seeing this is the next rising, rising wave in morality. I'm going to grab this. I'm going to sell it high real hard for a week. I'm going to dump all my energy into it. The next week it's gone. You know what I mean? And they're crashing possibly the quality of actually appreciating people. Right, yeah, there, well, there's no point in investing in people anymore because the Karens are buying on the dip, right? That's the, the thing, like next- to the next something lives matter movement. And yeah. I, yeah, I'm off this ride. I'm gonna invest in the one bumper sticker this week. Next week, it's gonna be obsolete because it's a new person I gotta defend. Like, I only got so many paper shields in my closet here. Right. There's only so much trunk space on my Scion XC yeah, or whatever. going through them like yeah. Russell Crowe and fucking Gladiator, <laughs> Christ. Uh, all right, so coming up on the podcast, because you guys really are at the point now where you could pick up your phone and call anyone. And if they've never heard of you, you could present them with numbers where it's like, well, this is what we can offer you. Like you can yeah. really come into a podcast inquiry as far as a guest is concerned, and you can make an offer that no one's going to refuse. Mm -hmm. Give me a three. Give me the three like, all right, you guys have, you know, you guys have had everything from from bishops to criminals to my dumbass to anyone, who would be the three that you haven't? 1,700 episodes, who would be three? Be like, all right, this is this is who I want in the chair. This is who I want in the hot seat. Well, so hopefully they'll be coming, right? So we have uh, um, Jordan Peterson scheduled for July. So that was a long time big goal for us. Like that was something that we all, we've admired the work he's been doing for a very long time and always wanted to get him on the show. We finally nailed him down um in july so he'll be on the show um, i'm currently going after right now and i'm having a hell of a time so believe it or not even with our size and everything like that the hardest thing is to get through to right. people some mm -hmm. right like you, there's always gatekeepers that just they don't know you know what i'm saying then they don't know any better like even if i flaunt numbers and say oh we're this big this or that like if, they, if that the gatekeeper doesn't know who we are or doesn't isn't you know impressed with that sometimes it takes it takes a while still so I'm trying to get uh, Patrick Bet David. Do you know who that is? No. So, the name. yeah, I didn't know who he was that long ago either, and I was like, yeah. "What? How did I miss this guy?" So, Patrick Bet David, um, and I'm so mad that I, I've missed him for this long. So he he look up Valuetainment on YouTube. Yeah, so he has, yeah. So he, I love the way this dude interviewed, and he's had some. He's one of the few people that's ever had uh, Jordan Peterson cry, like half of his interview with him. Look that up. Look at Jordan Peterson crying with Patrick Bet David. Uh, he had, um, uh, uh, what's the comedian? What's the, uh, Kevin Hart. He had one of the best interviews I've ever seen Kevin Hart do. I mean, he's had, he's had uh, all kinds of guests. He had uh, uh, Norm Chomsky. He had, um, he's had uh, all kinds of these really, and he'll take somebody who is completely opposite to his beliefs. He's, a, he's very much so free market capitalist, Milton Friedman type of guy. He's, uh, he came from the gym industry. He was a, a Bally's guy, the same time era that we are. So that's why I have this infinity for this dude and mm -hmm. want to meet him so bad because we, we were, he was hustling gyms memberships the same time Sal and I were hustling gym memberships. He was on the Bally side. We were on the 24 hour fitness side, which was a, a direct competitor. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty good in the L.A. area. Obviously, we were known in the Bay Area and stuff. And so if I just know if he were to meet us, we'd all hit it off because he went on from there to go build one of the largest insurance companies in, in the United States. And the guy is just a killer. He's, you know, he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He's a bad I think he's worth $150 million is what his net worth is. And he's self-made. He's got a hell of a story. And he's a really good interviewer. And he's got a great book called Your Next Five Moves which is probably in my top 10 list of good reads that I've read in the last two years. Um, and I like the way he communicates. I like the guess he has. So he's on that list right now for me. I just think that would be such a fun conversation. 
Um, and then maybe Thomas So. I like Thomas Sowell. I think is just one of the most brilliant minds uh, that are out there. He's old, so it'd be probably hard to get him uh, to come on here. But I would love to see those guys, which I know those are like weird guests that probably people listening are like, who the fuck are these dudes that you want on this podcast? But these are the people that intrigue me, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's who I selfishly uh, want to have and, and pick their brain. Like that. that we, now that we've reached this level that we have that kind of pull and power, like selfishly now, uh, I don't even care if it goes viral or not or what it does as far as downloads. Like I just want to sit in a room with that mind. And it's just like the Peter Linneman episode. I've been listening to Peter Linneman talk and he's one of my favorite economists because he's so non-biased. Like the, the Republicans think he's Democrat. Democrats think he's Republican because he's so non-biased, right? And I love the way he talks about economics. And so I was so excited to get him just so I could ask, because I have all the, I, I read a lot of stuff in real estate investing right now. And so I couldn't wait. And he's like one of the top real estate investors in the country uh, on top of being a world renowned economist. So I was like, I couldn't wait to just pick this dude's brain. Now the episode may not do very well. You know, or not a lot of people will listen to it, but selfishly, it was like I was a little kid. Adam's you know? portfolio, is, yeah, he's been, you know, he's he's really diversifying his assets and all that shit. Um, well, that's hopefully, a, I mean, sorry, go ahead. that's a lot. That's that's a lot of where my where I spend most of my time right now is the is the investment side of the business, right? So we, I do, I mean, I'm I probably look at a hundred properties a month to narrow down to ten to make offers on one and. Uh, you know, I'm constantly talking to uh, realtors and property managers. That's a that's a big arm of the business now. So I want you to go smart. ahead quickly and just look over your right shoulder. On oh, oh, sorry, your left shoulder. Camera's got me fucked up. Now, now take a look at that guy there on the shelf, real quick. Did you ever think that guy doing the boudoir photo shoots would be sitting here talking about? Value investing and property shit and Peter Lineman and Thomas, whoever the fuck. Hey, have you ever heard me tell the story of that picture? So uh, that no, picture you, you have my undivided attention. So that picture is really funny. So I got, I got, uh, so I had other pictures that, that were out there that this, this lady who's, who was, wrote a romance novel. She, um, she's writing this book and she found another picture of me and she's like, I, I, I would like you to be the cover and you know, I'm looking for you to send me over what photos you have. And I didn't really, I didn't have like a modeling portfolio or anything. I didn't think. Now I'd is this in the DM? Uh, how did she find me? Because this was even before Instagram, I think. Jesus. That's a good question. Facebook, I think, actually. I think Facebook, <laughs> this was, I had Facebook first. So I think she found me on Facebook. She messaged me this. Um, I was, I, this is before competing. So this was actually my journey of just going from fat to getting in shape. And uh, of course, I was posting pictures of my body all the time online. And so she found me that way. Anyways. Um, you know, there's no business. I'm not making money doing any of this stuff. And I, my best friend, my childhood best friend, we go all the way back to fourth grade, is a, is an amazing photographer. Now he does lands landscape stuff. That's what he's more into. Um, but he's you know he's a badass photographer. And I said, hey, I, this romance novel is going to pay me to for a cover. Would would you would you shoot me? And he's my best friend, so he's like, yeah, I'll do it, bro. Talk about, I mean, I don't know what your relationship are with your boys. And if you're not a guy like this, this is not my thing. This is not his thing. If you can only imagine what this scene was like in his living room, if him not shooting bodies, it's not his thing. And his best friend's like, you got to get, you got to get this, you know, we got to look at me like this and like me trying poses and putting water on me and him shooting <laughs> different angles. And Bro, it was the most awkward you know, day of photo shooting, I'll ever think. I'm forever grateful to him. I, there's, I did a post about it a long time ago on my Instagram where I wrote all about it. Uh, when he, when it, it uh, obviously when it got big and was on a, on a book and everything like that. But my best friend was just like, never again, bro. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't like, look can't. him in the eye when I ask him to record one of my sets. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I just look at the ground and be like, yeah, they're right? bicep curls. Just fucking do it. Just don't like, judge that's me. That's weird. That's weird enough. Yeah. Just to, and I mean, I had ones where I'm like, you know, half pulling my shorts down oh, and just, man. oh, dude. Just it's wait, his mom walks in or some bullshit. Oh, I it swear, was, it's for a cover. Oh, it was just, it was so, it was so bad. And I, and I, I promised him, I said, I'll never do that to you again, bro. And I appreciate you doing that to me. In fact, the money I got paid for that, I gave him, it wasn't a lot of money i gave him all the money <laughs> so therapy like, this yeah. is just for the therapy yeah. 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 we'll talk in a few months just get it sorted out cognitive behavioral stuff will yeah. be fine yeah but you know what's crazy though i mean this would i would have never thought it would have looked like this um as far as what what mind pump is but that was always the goal i mean that was the goal that the day i took a picture of my body and put it out into the ether um it was never about look at my body or i want to be a model one day it was like 
I had at that moment, because I didn't have Facebook, I didn't have Instagram, I didn't have YouTube, I turned it on with the intentions, I'm going to build an e-commerce business around fitness. I had no idea it was gonna look like this, I had no idea I was gonna meet Sal and Doug and then bring on Justin, like I did not know it was gonna look like that, but I did turn all that on with that intention. So that that I had that vision way back when of, you know, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get all this attention virtually to then be able to present the message. Because what I saw on Facebook and especially Instagram was these kids that had millions of followers that were making tons of money that were given terrible advice. Mm -hmm. And I know some fitness people, like friends of mine, like Lane, they they attack that and they get so angry about it. But I was like, oh, there's huge opportunity here. Yeah. I mean, if- Well, if, it's funny because knowing you back in those days, like I don't, there's no discernible difference in you now than the guy that sat down, tatted up. The, the, the even to see your watch now, it's like, oh, this is what watches should be like, yeah. a normal size. You were walking in with yeah. like Flava Flav with this Nixon piece that was yeah. like 10 centimeters across. I was like- The hubcap. He's got the fucking, the lid low, the bicep vein. There's the, you know, it was a lot, it wasn't a medium shirt. You you were fucking, yeah. you were jacked yeah. when I met you. But it's yeah. to talk to you now is to talk to you then. So it's like your intentions were clear from the get-go that you had a head on the big shoulders and, and to watch what you guys have done and to been a, a part of it. And to, you know, th this wouldn't exist without you guys. I told Sal that, and I'll tell you that. Um, it's always whenever, and he's heard me say this to, to Sal, whenever I'm in the most obscure corners of the world, uh, held up in some converted old mosque that's now a hostel in the Middle East, and I get, you know, oh, I saw you. And like, sometimes they don't even speak English and they just point to a mind pump video. So what you guys, I don't think you guys have a, have an idea of how much reach mm -hmm. you guys have had, the impact you've had on me, on Killian, yeah. on the fitness industry, dude. I appreciate you so much taking the time uh, to sit down with us. Next time it's gonna be in person. Um, we're gonna have to sneak across the border at some point before the year's out to come pay our, pay our respects. Uh, in the meantime, Good luck. I'm not going to do the thing that people do. Because they you can know find where him. to find yeah. him. Because if you found us. me, you found me through this yeah. guy. So Adam, man, I appreciate you so we, much. We, 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 we appreciate uh, everything you're doing, bro. I mean, that, from the day we met you, uh, we knew you were one of the good guys. Um, and that was always important to us is to make sure we highlight those people. And I'll, I'll never stop that. We'll never, we'll never get too big for, uh, for people that are like you that are putting out the good, the good message and the right content and stuff. And I just... I, I'm, I feel so grateful that we met. So I appreciate you. You've always been somebody too that's reciprocated that. Um, and in business, I, I value that so much. Uh, and I think it's hard. You Believe it or not, I do a lot for a lot of people. And uh, it's one out of 10 maybe that, that get it, you know? And you get it. You're like one of those people that from the very beginning, you were appreciative of that. And for that, we have this tremendous love for for you and everything that you're doing. And we'll always think of you guys as family. So love you guys. Well, much love, man. Thanks, much Doug. love to Doug for taking the time. Yeah, thanks, um, Doug. To the family, everyone, all that, man. We'll catch you. We'll catch you on the other side.